tell me about the difficulties of trying to get inside the Viking mindset because there are pre-Christian people, there are there are barely literate people. There's there's very little written from within. It's all outsiders' perceptions. Yeah. How do you begin to reconstruct how they thought about the world? It's very difficult. It's uh, extremely difficult to do that. You have to use a, a fair amount of empathy. You have to use. I mean, archaeology is is really the, the major source. Now, I'm not an archaeologist, but but I. Uh, of course, in, in the course of research for a book like this, you do try to cover everything that archaeology has contributed. And uh, rune stones, the skaldic poetry, which is this very elaborate poetry, which contains the, the skaldic poets were the custodians of the what we, spiritual culture rather than religious culture. And, and so that they were, so to speak, the experts on all the stories of the gods and the creation myths and, and the death myths, what happens after you die and so on. Although these things weren't written down, they were composed according to such very strict metrical and technical rules that they survived over the centuries unchanged because you couldn't change them. Any later scribe would have known that he couldn't possibly get in there and change it, otherwise it wouldn't work. Really very, very tight metrical and technical rules. So that those poems, these, they're, very often, they're very often praise poems as well of a king that relate his battles, where he was, what he did. That's one kind of source. You do get written sources from, you know, Iceland, you know, you get Ari, Ari the Wise, and uh, and you get Snotty, but that's much later. You have to, I mean, really, you, you can't theorise in a watertight way at all. You just have to be aware all the time that you can't completely rely on, on, on the written sources, not even on written sources such as like Adam of Bremen's uh, history of the Archbishopric of, of, of Hamburg Bremen, because often these people had a kind of hidden agenda. I don't mean that to sound sinister, but... They were writing these histories for a purpose. Adam's purpose was to promote the role, for political reasons, of his diocese in the conversion of the Scandinavian countries. It was in actual fact, there was more missionaries from England were involved in that particular, in the in the mission fields in Scandinavia. Uh, Ali wanted to 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 uh, promote the role of his own ancestors, uh, make them more important in the settlement of Iceland. And so on. You just have to be slightly aware of these things, but you'll never reach some kind of cold, objective truth about it. You just have to share with the reader the fact that, well, these are the conditions of the study. I'm not going to call them problems because what's the point? It's still, it's still if you can weave it in at the same time as leaving people with an awareness of the fact that this is true, but this is a little bit more doubtful, but it's possible. Yeah. And, and historical characters are always, as you suggest, sort of slipping off into the idiom of legend, aren't they? They're, they're, it's very difficult to know when, when the, the history stops and the legend begins. Yeah. I think a lot of people who are very keen on the Viking period, I think they know about the Viking period. What they know about is the legend, around that hairy breeches, you know, and Ivor the Boneless and uh, Harold Bluetooth, these wonderful names. I make some attempt to disentangle fact from fiction, but it's extremely difficult. And that's one, it's actual fact, it's one of the beauties of the story that these people become legend and that being a non-literate, I won't say illiterate, I, I don't think they were any less intelligent than the, than their Christian, than the Christians, but they, they simply didn't develop that kind of writing culture. They had runes and they carved things in stone and they made poetry orally. Is it possible to say, in a, an age which was very marked by its violence, that the Vikings were, even by those standards, exceptionally violent? Or is that just because the chronicles come from the other side, as it were, and so the shock is at being attacked rather than doing the attacking? It's, it's hard to know. I mean, if you look at the, the literary vicinity of the Lindisfarne attack at the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, there's a lot of brutality that's got nothing to do with Vikings that both precedes the entry, for example, of Lindisfarne and, the, and, and, and succeeds it. But there again, the kind of violence described is often for political ends. Remember that these first raids have no known reason at all. Part of the bewilderment of them was that, what, what, what have we done to these people? I mean, the 806, I think the, the, the Iona community, I don't know, Hebride, was wiped out. There were 68 members. It's shocking because it's a small number of people, but it's also shocking because it's a large number of people. And the analysts knew exactly how many people were killed. And if it was just robbery, they were interested in why kill these people? And why burn the churches down? The word psychopathic is almost meaningless, but in the, me in the way that we understand that meaningless word, there's a psychopathic edge to this, which I think probably goes a little bit beyond the, the violence that was current. I mean, in the Irish annals, you find too, the, the, the monasteries regular, regularly fought pitched battles with each other. 
but you, you, and you'll find references to the fact that such and such a king burnt the land of this monastery up to the church door. He didn't burn the church itself. They were observing some kind of standard of behavior, but the, the Vikings, it seems part of the aim of the thing was to burn the church and to, to trash the institution. There's an entry in the Royal Frankish Annals, uh, which describes a, man, a Saxon who was uh, killed in the act of trying to set fire to a church. It was part of the aim of attacking a church was to set fire to it. Mm. which to me strengthens the idea that there's some kind of cultural hatred going on or a cultural vendetta is underway. I wondered, finally, if you could just sort of say what you think the lasting legacy in this country was of the Viking settlements and the contact in that direction for the, for the indigenous people. I guess the lasting, um, the, the manifestations which are most evident to us now would be place names, particularly in the east and the northwest of the country. I mean, these are the lower stuffed, Grimsby, Nutsford, all over the place. Once you know what you're looking for, an extraordinary number of names of these places have, uh, are um, from Scandinavian. Extraordinary number of words are from, uh, from Scandinavian. And unlike the kind of words that, that came in after the, the Norman conquest, which were, since that was an aristocratic con conquest, they would be words associated with the kitchen, the sort of uh, upper class, to use an anachronistic term, but upper class. Whereas most of the, the, the loan words, or the words that have gone into the English and Scottish that I'm talking about, they were more, more prosaic words. So there's, the, I guess those are the, those in, in, in the sense of knowing, and the value of that is just knowing where we came from. It's just knowing that the names have a meaning. If you trace it back, things come from somewhere. I find a certain comfort in that, you know.